Damien, what's this evening's event all about? This evening's event is the launch of the National Hunger Strike uh, 33rd anniversary, which takes place in Derry Lynn uh, next Sunday, the 3rd of August, assemble at 2.30. I would appeal to all the people that can to turn out on the day uh, in Derry Lynn for this uh, 33rd anniversary of the National Hunger Strike. Tonight we launch the campaign here in Ballyconnell Community Centre with our main speaker, uh, Owen Cairn, him being the main speaker and uh, the theme of the lecture tonight is the legacy of Bobby Sands uh, and I think it's very appropriate and that Owen uh, is the main speaker as he acted as election agent for Bobby Sands and also Sadly, when Bobby lost his life on hunger strike, that Owen went on to retain that seat. There's people here in this uh, hall tonight that uh, wasn't around and doesn't know the ins and outs of what took place during the hunger strikes. Uh, some of them weren't born, some of them are here to hear the stories and a huge turning point in Irish history when 10 young men lost their lives in 1981 on hunger strike. Looking back now, 33 years, it's still hard to probably to articulate all the emotions and the feelings and the pain and the memories of the hunger strike period. And the hunger strike for me uh, stands out as a major happening in my lifetime. And I believe it will be so in the history of modern Ireland. And even at this remove of over 30 years, it's still hard for those of us who were closely involved with the hunger strikers and their families to go back there in our memories. And I've found it hard always to speak on the subject because it was an, an intensely emotional and painful time for nationalists and Republican people. And on the surface, as many of you who are as old as me will remember, it was a time of, on the surface of black flags and torchlight processions and campaigning meetings in little halls like uh, Kilesher and Cunyan and uh, rosaries at street corners. And there was a great sense of crisis amongst our people, but also a great sense of solidarity. Uh, but it was much more, something else, Something more profound happened in 81 that changed forever the political landscape in the north of Ireland and had resonances uh, for the Irish struggle far beyond these shores and far beyond that time. It was a watershed period in our history and things would never be the same again. And no doubt to me these ten men died for us and they died to make us equal. It seems a long time now, back to 1980, when myself and others like Betty Leonard and Pat Cox met in Lynham's Hotel in Derry Lynn to form for Manor H Block Committee. Lynham's was the only place that would let us in, and Kalesha Hall was one of the few parochial halls that would give us access and give us access on a continual basis. The situation was completely different then to now. And of course, various people came to that meeting, people like Bernie O'Connor from Enniskillen and Bernard Leighton, and I remember Stephen Maguire, who was then a young man from Irvinstown, and Patsy McGee, who's now dead from Belcou. And of course, there's a great contingent of dollars from Erin East, people like Eamon Carey and Loretta Leeson, and councillors like the late John Jim McCusker, and uh, independent councillor Paddy McCaffrey, and there was always a smattering of Republican ex prisoners and some Sinn Fein activists. But perhaps Tommy Murray. The SDLP councillor who came along with John McMahon uh, was the most significant, as he was later to be expelled from the SDLP for signing Bobby Sands' his nomination papers. I believe at that time we did a fair job at highlighting the prisoners' plight during the first hunger strike, which ended on December the 19th, 1980. And I remember the sense of disbelief and sense of confusion when the strike ended suddenly. We were at a meeting, I remember, in Irvinstown. Uh, and we had a march planned for Inniskillen on the Saturday. And as it was, we went ahead with that march and we had a short meeting at the Railway Hotel uh, addressed by Neil Blaney TD from Donegal, who was one of the few people in the Dáil who would always have supported us. Little did we realise, but the situation was far from resolved and over Christmas we were still in the dark as Humphrey Atkins and the British government set about being their usual duplicious selves. I remember well March the 1st, 1981, and seeing a few lines in a national paper that a man called Bobby Sands was going on hunger strike. And really, there was very little publicity about the event or interest outside of Republican circles. Of course, fate played a major hand, and none of us in Fermanagh realised how significant was to be the death of Frank Maguire when he died suddenly. I remember being at his funeral in Nistan Ski and seeing Bernard McAlliskey arrive on crutches. She had just survived a loyalist ambush. 
uh, an attempt on her life. In the days that followed, I remember going to Carrigan Shannon to meet with Rory O'Brady in the county hotel in Carrigan Shannon, who asked me about what views I had on the possible succession to Frank Maguire's seat. And I had known that both Noel Maguire and Bernard McAlisky were making capes. And I remember well the meeting in the Swan Lake Hotel uh, in Monaghan, where Fermanagh and Tyrone Republicans got together, and it was first muted publicly by the Sinn Féin leadership that there was a possibility of a prisoner called Bobby Sands Stanton. The vast majority of the Republicans in Fermanagh and Tyrone voted against him running. It was felt that he'd have no chance, and were he to lose, would be very disastrous. But I remember a few of us stayed behind, and we effectively reversed the decision of the meeting. And I remember then the frantic efforts to get Noel Maguire to stand aside and give Bobby Sands a clear run. The SDLP intimated that they would stand aside only for Noel Maguire. I remember one Sunday Kevin Agnew from South Derry coming up to listen to Ski to plead with Noel Maguire. And I can still see the tears in old Kevin's eyes as he came for a cup of tea and Leeson's at 103 thrusting away. I remember the loneliness of these days as I felt somewhat isolated having been chosen as Sands election agent, yet it was difficult to get him a clear field. Most ro local Republicans were against him running and were plumping and backing Maguire. I had the job of getting Bobby uh, Sands' nomination paper signed. Loretta Leeson and Eamon Carey were happy to sign, as was Paddy Foster. Tommy Murray stood tall as he proposed Bobby Sands and ha consequently had himself expelled from the SDLP. On the last day of nominations on the Monday, I remember, myself and Paddy Foster set off for Dungannon, where we went to Jimmy McGivern's house in the Ballygally Road housing estate, where we met Jim Gibney, Jerry Adams and Bernadette McAlliskey. This was to be a day of brinkmanship, a day that the prisoners ultimately won when at the last minute Noel Maguire arrived at their electoral office accompanied by Bernie Maguire and that other character, Cunningham, he was called the Codology Candidate, and withdrew his nomination. Uh, Bobby Sands was now the only nationalist candidate in the field, but we all knew we had a fight in our hands, because even with a clear fight, we knew that it would be very difficult. The question would be, would the SDLP supporters come out would we get the necessary support? We had no resources, not even an office or a room. And you have to remember this was a time before mobile phones and we needed a room that we could place a phone in. I remember Pat Cox searching in his skillin for premises. I remember him being insulted by many Catholic businessmen, the few that there were in the town, threw him out, one of them I remember. And it looked very grim. And I remember standing on the diamond talking to Pat and I'm sure he remembered it himself and he said to me, I know a little woman, he says, will give us a, a place. And I says, well, you're joking. And he says, he went down, he said, wait here. And I remember waiting up at the diamond at a, at a post box, and he came back, he says, I've got it. And she was a lady originally from Kinali, she was Mary Drum, and she gave us her front room of her house in 26 Water Street. So, despite great harassment from the RUC and UDR, the nationalists of, from Anna and South Tyrone were superb over the next nine days, and a great team of workers were put together from all over Ireland who flocked to 26 Water Street. I remember people came from Kerry and Dublin and Belfast and Mayo and they were guided by experienced election workers like the late Tony Maguire and many more who worked round the clock for the nine days of the campaign. The atmosphere was hectic and it was terrific and electric and many, many people submerged former differences to pull out all the stops. I remember Paddy McCaffrey and I read Leeson, they were the people that tied down the office. And I remember the two, there was only one phone, I can still see their two hands grabbing for the phone calls. Paul Corrigan came on board and gave us great support. Frank McManus, who was a former MP, came out and spoke for us. Bernie O'Connor, who was a good election worker, helped us. Many women came to help, and indeed many young people. Young people like Pauline Drum, who was only 14 years of age. Young people like the three Leeson sisters came. And many others, people came from all over. Uh, so huge numbers give of their time and money and give willingly. I remember one man, a man called Gabriel Midlin, he's from Leitrim. He's now only one leg. He was only a young man in his 40s. I remember him, he didn't want to annoy people and he booked into the railway hotel and spent the nine days in the railway hotel at huge cost to himself. I remember the day of the count and stepping forward to accept the seat on behalf of Bobby Sands and on behalf of the prisoners. 
The atmosphere in the tech was electric. Many of you were there. The world media was there. The place was crowded. Bobby's mother and his sister Marcella were there. There were hundreds of RUC and there was huge tension. In fact, I can remember on the night before that Joe McConnell from the, up at Mount Cross, he slept with the RUC in the boxes so that they wouldn't be tampered with. And I can still hear in my mind Danny Morrison's huge cheer as he interrupted the returning officer, the unionist Alison Patterson, when he announced that Bobby Sands had got 39,492 votes. And of course the place went wild. It was a defining moment. It is as if we didn't realise it. Against all the odds we had won, and Fermanagh South Tyrone had delivered. And I was very proud being from Fermanagh because from the time of Michael Davitt, Fermanagh had been called the county of the standbackers. But this time we had come to the fore. It was a crucial victory, but in, and in my naivety I thought that it would save Bobby Sands' life. But of course we know that it didn't. I first met Bobby Sands when he was 30 days on hunger strike and saw him roughly for the next 30 days. I was unprepared for my task. I'd never been to jail, and going up to see him was fairly intimidating. The hitch block to a person like me was the lion's den, and you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. I met him in the prison hospital. Those first visits, he was in good shape, able to be up. He was keen to know what was happening. I, of course, was down in Fermanagh and far away from the centre of events in Belfast, but I did my best to relay what was happening as I saw it. Of course, he knew much more than I did, as he was central to the strike and in constant contact with the outside. Unlike the photograph of a long-haired man, he was actually short-haired, but he was strong in character and committed and concerned, and despite his surroundings and where he was and who was around him, he was sincere and gentle. He had a great relationship, obviously, with his mother and his sister, Marcella, and he felt very much for them and what they were going through. It never ever crossed his mind in any of our conversations that he should stop. He always knew that he would die, and perhaps that one other would die as well before the British would move. About the 45th day of the hunger strike, I remember um, getting a call from the National Hitch Block Committee, in fact from Dahi O'Connell, um, on the day before and on the night before, to say that I was to bring in a delegation uh, to visit Bobby Sands, and I was told to go to the Fairways Hotel, which I went to in Dundalk at five o'clock in the morning. And there I was met by uh, Dr John O'Connell, who was the former Health Minister in Hoffey's government, by Neil Blaney TD, and by Sheila de Valera. And we drove up in my car to um, Newry RUC barracks, where we were intercepted and put in, jammed into a convoy, and rushed up the motorway to Long Kesh. And a, a warder showed us in and he said, Mr. Sands, he says, visits from European MPs. He must have said I was one as well. But he was quite ill. Bobby was quite <coughs> ill at the time, but he was coherent. And it was obviously a very emotional meeting. O'Connell, being a medical doctor, checked him out medically first. And he had told Blaney when he going in, I'm going to ask him to come off the strike. And he begged him during the conversation to come off the strike. But, of course, Bobby resisted. Sheila de Valera was crying, and they were all struck by his courage and commitment and what he and the prisoners were enduring and what they had endured on the blanket protest. I remember well my last visit with him on the Saturday before he died. He was really weak, he was blind, he was totally gaunt and emaciated, lying on a sheepskin rug on a waterbed because his bones were sticking out and he could barely speak. He asked me if there was any change in things, and I said not, and he replied, well, he says, that's it then. Go and see my parents and look after my ma. Uh, I was shocked by the imminence of his death, but I went along with Jim Gibney. We went up to see his mother and father and sister, and it was a sad meeting. We all knew that time was getting short. I was at home in Mackin. On the Monday night, a Tuesday morning of May the 5th, when a few minutes after one, Jim Gibney phoned me to say that Bobby Sands had died at 1.10. They had let him die and discarded all our votes. Jim Gibney asked me to go to Belfast, and I said out in the middle of the night. And when I arrived at Broadway, of course, the place was all rioted and uh, all destruction. But I got through anyhow, and I went to Tom Hartley's house. 
and in the afternoon Bobby was brought home to his parents' house in Quinbrook, where he was waked. Thousands fell by his coffin. I remember people from home coming up. People, Paul Corrigan, I remember there, who's down here tonight, and Patsy Heave, and Frank Keenan, who's now dead, remember the call. And I remember very well Frank saying to me that he was glad to be able to come to see the remains of such a great patriot. On the day of his funeral, I remember looking backwards from the hearse and seeing the 100,000 strong crowd and myself and Jerry Adams said to each other how sound and how loyal the Irish people were at the back of it all, despite all the ways we had been divided. It was a great difficulty that I spoke at the funeral in Milltown, but I managed to get through it, and I hope I said some of the right things. Events were moving so fast, and there was no time till Francie Hughes died. I remember myself and Jimmy Drum being sent over uh, to with the family as he was being removed from Beaver Park Hospital and how the RUC attacked the undertakers, broke the hearse windows and pulled myself and the undertaker from the vehicle, hoping that they could com commandeer it. But uh, luckily they weren't able to do so, they couldn't get it started. When we did get going, we were harassed by the RUC because we were boxed into a convoy and loyalists stoned us all the way to Tomb Bridge um, and over to Balahi. And we stopped at, outside the Hughes' Lane. I remember big John Davy who was later killed by loyalists, stepping forward and placing the tricolour on Francis Hughes' coffin. And we, we brought him in to his uh, father and mother's bungalow. And the following day as he was waked and he was, got a soldier's farewell in his native place. The other occasion I remember well was going into Long Kesh at around this time, the end of July uh, 1981, I was asked to go in along with Jerry Adams and Seamus Ruddy of the, S of the IRSP. Father Fall had intervened with the families and was applying pressure on mothers and wives to take their loved ones off. He was arguing that it was the movement outside that was continuing the strike. I remember we went in and Jerry Adams asked me to be a witness to talk to them. We met the remaining strikers along with Bick McFarland, who was the OC. We met them in the dining room. Adams told them the accurate position as he saw it. The Brits weren't moving, and the likelihood was that they would not move at all, and that their probability was that if the strikers didn't come off, all of them would die. They must decide for themselves whether to go ahead or not. But he said that he, for his part, would happily go outside and face the media and explain that the prisoners wanted to end the strike. Tom McElwee was there, as was Mickey Devine, Paddy Quinn, Matt Devlin, uh, Liam McCluskey, and a few others. Kieran Doherty, the TD for Cavan here, was so ill in bed he couldn't come to the meeting. But he, we spoke to him in his cell and he could understand, and he said he wasn't coming off the strike. <coughs> Kevin Lynch was beyond talking to his father and mother were with him. He was already dying and we couldn't speak with him. Tom McElwee and Mickey Devine spoke in unison that they would give Thatcher everything they'd got, meaning that they would go ahead. We shook hands with them and left. But of course, it was a time of tremendous crisis, a time of battle when the prisoners and the Republican people were standing shoulder to shoulder against Britain. In the first week of August, Kevin Lynch, Kieran Doherty and Tom McElwee died. On the 20th of August, the same day as I was elected by the people in Fermanagh South Tyrone to succeed Bobby Sands because another prisoner couldn't stand, Mickey Devine died that day. Red Mick from Derry was the last hunger strike to die because increasingly families took their sons off and the strike lost momentum. After 217 days of hope, of despair, of suffering, and exceptional courage, the prisoners called off their strike in early October. It was an extraordinary time. Never before had the Irish situation hit the world stage. Bobby Sands and the hunger strikers were known all over the world, and Britain were now in the dock of world public opinion. Thousands of people walked down the Champs-Élysées in Paris in protest when Bobby Sands died. The Indian Parliament stood in silence. The longshore men of New blocked the port of New York. In Tehran, 
the new government named the main thoroughfare Bobby Sand Street. The struggle was now seen clearly for what it was, a political issue between Britain and Ireland. I, of course, remember well the suffering and the tragedy for the families and the heartbreak it was and the suffering and pain for the prisoners. It should never happen again, and I don't believe it will. It was a campaign for its time. As Sands wrote, what is gained is gained for the Republic. What is lost is lost for the Republic. I think the losses have been great. Ten young men and a whole generation of people have been wiped out, people who would all be my age now. And in the overall 30-year struggle, we all know so many who have been lost. But of course, much has been gained. I think the hunger strike changed a lot. It certainly broke the British criminalisation strategy. It refuted Britain's role in Ireland and showed her as the aggressor and occupier. It politicised Republicans and Nationalists and gave us some strength. The prisoners ultimately got their demands and won a huge moral victory. Nationalists and Republicans were matured and politicised. It gave birth to Sinn Féin as a radical party of growing strength and capacity. But in some way, we are sad at the loss. I'm sad at the loss and the grief of what has happened, and we aren't able to save their lives. It's as if these ten men died for us, and they died to make us equal. And as we all know, not many would die for you and give their lives. I and the nationalist people are now more equal than before, more confident now in pushing onwards for the freedom in the Republic that is yet to be achieved. It's a time to remember, and the memories of these ten men must be cherished, because somehow they have won a freedom for us we didn't have, and the price of that freedom has been so great. So today Sinn Féin is the largest party, all Ireland party. We have the future in the palm of our hands, but it's like water, and we have to grip our hands and play our cards correctly. We mustn't fail through incompetence or arrogance. We can't take the people and our supporters for granted. We can't plough over people, but try and take them along the road with us in brotherhood and sisterhood and comradeship. Sinn Féin must always remember what Bobby said. Let our revenge be the laughter of our children in a new republic. We must never become like other parties, but build on an Ireland party that can take power and enact a republic where people have rights. Shasimwij Leshen Kush Winshjo. We stand with the ordinary people. Stand against the multinationals and the beef barons and the big bankers who want to plunder our economy for their own personal gain. We must be clear on who we are. We are the people who walk the streets with black flags. We stand with our local communities and we oppose and should oppose without equivocation the big mercenaries who would destroy our country with developments like fracking for gas which will not benefit our people. We must always listen to the people and lead them. It's hard now for all those who weren't par uh, part of that time, who probably weren't even born, to understand what really occurred back then. But I hope that as nationalists and republicans grow in freedom, as they stride forwards, as they pursue the new reality and avail of the changed situation in Ireland, I hope they will appreciate the confidence, the freedom and equalisation that has been won, because it has been gained at a heavy price, not least the lives and courage of the ten very ordinary but very exceptional young men, and we must remember them here tonight and forever. And I just want to finish with a little poem by Pierce McLaughlin. He said, Darkened years of winter have passed, summer waits for spring before it lives. Blanket clad and wasted, the winter has been long. No gleam of hope a thoughtless nation gives. In silence we walk the streets as one by one our hunger strikers died. Their memory is forever in my mind, pictures of their faces in my eyes. My sorrow and grief will not subside, and my love for them I will not disguise. In silence we walk the streets, as one by one our hunger strikers died. O'Hara, Hughes, McCreesh and Sands, Doherty and Lynch, Macdonald, Horson, McElwee, Devine. Gurum Ayodhya.
I think it's very, very important, particularly for the young people who came here tonight. Many of us lived through the events that Owen described. I myself was on the run at the time. I came from the county. I worked for the uh, election of Kieran Doherty. Extremely important that the young people, that we never ever go back to those days. And only when Owen was describing them, did it bring you back that you really did live through those times. And you look at the Gaza today, horrible, horrible. We lived through horrible times as well. And I think it's important that we mobilise people each year to remember the hunger strikers and including all of the people who died. And we have it in, in Derry Lane this Sunday and I think it's we are very proud to bring it because we elected Bobby. This is where the struggle changed. This is where the watershed was. Well, we came here tonight to see Owen as obviously he's our former MP. And we just I found it me and all the other young ones said it was we found it really inspiring. I can almost like feel the emotion in the air when he was talking about the time of the hunger strike. And it's hard for us to kind of think about that because we all we were born, you know, way after the time. But it's good to hear like a first hand account of it. And uh, it is it, it we could feel the emotion, we could see even him getting emotional himself about it. I just think it's amazing the way they were through that era. And now they're from the political era, now they're in the same. I kind of feel like we are the future generation of the Republican movement and we should be even more out in our drives, out supporting this. And they were saying there there was people as young as 17, 18 in the jails being arrested. And oh, well, that's not our time now, but it's our, we have a different role and we should be fulfilling that fully, absolutely. And I'd encourage everyone to come out and help do their part. Oh, and Karen, you can tell that the uh, telling of that story doesn't get easier by time, but how is important is it that young and old continue to keep it front and centre? Well, uh, well, I think it's very important, I suppose, particularly that young people, uh, people who weren't alive at that time, because it's now 33 years, I think it's very important that they know and that they understand uh, the price that has been paid for the achievements that we have achieved so far. And of course, we're, we've still a, some distance to go to get into a republic that we would like to be in. You know, and uh, hopefully that uh, uh, people will see that the hunger strike of '81 is probably uh, the most momentous event at the end of that century, as 1916 was at the beginning of it. You know. In terms of the, the message for young people that that sacrifice sends out, what do you think it is? Well, I, well, I think the message is that uh, you know that if you believe and if you understand um, the sacrifice that was made to get thus far and to get the, uh, to the, the Irish question on the world stage and to get it seen clearly for what it, what it is, that, uh, that, the, that young people, uh, first of all, that they, aren't, that they get to know and secondly, that they do something about it, that they become actively involved in some way, whether it's uh, voting for Sinn Féin, working for Sinn Féin, working in their communities uh, to bring about uh, uh, a country and a republic where people have uh, rights rather than one that's run in the in uh, a country that's run in the interest of big uh, companies, multinationals, developers and all the rest of it, you know.